I think I'm a little stand there, just, just in case. Is that working well? It's not working well. But anyway, I can't be kidding. Okay. Or I can stay in there and do it if you want to. No, it's Okay, so uh, welcome everyone. Uh, this panel is on exchange rates, growth, and inequality. And it may be a little broader than that due to last minute revisions we had to make. Um, let's see, our first speaker is uh, Dr. Martinez and Hernandez on the real exchange rate effect of demand and economic growth. Please welcome Dr. Hernandez. Thank you. Uh, well, this, uh, this uh, presentation is very good. Uh, the objective is to assess and measure the effects of the, uh, the, the, the evaluation on economic growth. And um, well, let me show you this first. Uh, this is the, uh, I mean, this, this is not try to show that the, the, the understanding of the chain rate, right, this is important, right? We have here a cover of the, the economists where you can see that the, even in Europe where they have the same uh, Currency, right? They have uh, problems in, in terms of the competitiveness. So, well, uh, my, one of my chapters in my dissertation was to, to study and to, uh, to explain what is the main driver of the reality chain rate, right? And for that chapter, I use uh, Albert Shea's theory of uh, the reality chain rate. And there, I, I discuss that uh, is, is the unit labor cost which uh, drives the reality chain rate. This was uh, one of my chapters. In the, the other chapter that I will discuss today, uh, basically I took uh, Daniel Roderick's uh, approach to measure the index of undervaluation and overvaluation. Right, guys? So, so I, I took this not necessarily because I agree with uh, his position. It's basically because uh, Keynesian or classical Keynesian, they just said uh, pretty much the, the PPP, right? The purchasing power party. Right? And uh, also I took this because this is a way to to discuss uh, uh, among uh, Latin American economies who claim that the real devaluation will or could enhance economic growth, right? I really don't don't agree too much with that position, right? Because for example, I'm from Mexico, and every time that the, the cherry loops there, right, that creates uh, many problems, right? The, the, the country completely fell apart. Uh, probably you have heard about the first financial crisis in right, the 20th century. The 21st century was in Mexico, right? So I know that the problems that uh, are created by the real exchange devaluation. Okay, so well, the first uh, two points, I discuss this index of, uh, of the evaluation, right? I try to follow step by step the uh, Daniel Rodrick uh, methodology, right? And when I did that, I, I encountered several problems. Uh, he and uh, also another paper by Rasmi and Rapetti, they also do the same methodology. You see the, the the payment tables, the 6.2, right? So uh, when I start doing this, uh, the, the, payment was, the payment tables 7.1, they were available. So I used those uh, the tables. And uh, this is the, the, the index of the reality chain rate that these guys are using. This is the log of the reality chain rate. And I had two subscripts because one uh, means from, from the cross section and the other four for time zero, right? So it's, it's a panel data framework here. And here we have the ratio of the uh, nominal chain rate, right? And uh, in terms of the US dollar. And the, the future power parity conversion factor. That is basically the index of prices of one country divided by the United States uh, prices, right? So anytime that this index is above uh, uh, zero, right, that indicates that the chain rate is undervalued. When it's below zero, that means that it's overvalued. Okay? So this is the, the formulation that the uh, uh, Daniel Rodrigue uh, uh, uses, right? Uh, uh, and then uh, he is trying to discount the, uh, the effect of the, uh, the increase in the, nominal, the, the GDP per capita, right? When we do this kind of regression, this beta, it's called the balance of summers and effect, right? Because we know that uh, there are different productivities between developed countries and developing countries. Usually, productivity is much higher in developed countries, right? And that, for that reason, the level of prices is going up much quickly, right? And uh, the, the, the opposite is in, in developing countries, right? So this, this uh, regression 
try to discount the effect of these uh, different levels of productivity in countries. Okay, so once we get this, we um, um, ob obtain the real chain rate, right? Without the factor, right? Discounting the factor of the uh, productivity so in con con on the real GDP. So the real uh, chain rate. So I start doing this, but when I, when I start working with the new FPM uh, tables, I encounter different patterns uh, between uh, uh, the real chain rate and the uh, income per capita. Uh, well, first of all, they use 184 countries. In my case, I, I'm using 98 con 96 countries because there, there were, the data was, uh, was available for those countries from, from the 60s to 2010. And you can see here the pattern for all the countries. Really, there is no any pattern at all, right? When uh, it occurred to me that probably I could find a pattern if I uh, separate the countries between the more or less homogeneous regions, right? So here I'm taking only developing countries. Here I'm taking the developing countries, 25 developing countries. Here uh, uh, countries for, uh, for Africa, countries for Asia, and countries for Latin America. As you can see in here, the only the only uh, several countries that follow what Balas and Samuelson were talking about in the 60s uh, are the, the developed countries, right? As the income increases, the income per capita increases, the real exchange rate appreciates, right? This is a perfect uh, resembles resembles re, uh, resemble of what the this Samuels, uh, Balas and Samuelson effect uh, try to explain. Right? The other countries didn't follow any pattern at all, uh, right, really. So, so my, my claim is that uh, Daniel Rodrik and also Rafetis and uh, Razmi measured, but the real channel is, is misleading because they are taking all the countries as a whole, right, and, and, and trying to calculate one balance sum effect for all of them. So whatever they are saying is, is wrong, right, according to this perspective. So uh, what I did here, I continue with this methodology, but instead of using all the sample, I separate the sample by, di by different regions in the world, right? In order to come out with, with more homogeneous uh, balance samples and effect. Okay, so yes, I, I, I estimate the, the, the regression, and I can see different uh, balance samples and effects, right? Different levels of, uh, of uh, uh, the growth rate of prices. It's different in, in developed countries and developing countries. And as uh, we can see here, that uh, for developed countries, it's, it's almost exactly what Balasa uh, Samuelson effect uh, mentioned in the, in the 60s. It's uh, around 30% per year, the appreciation of the return rate due to the increase in prices. Okay. So again, uh, the, the statistical relationship here, as you can see, these are all the countries, all my, my example of countries from the 60s to 2010. And uh, you can see more or less a pattern here, right? Uh, but the countries that tend to have the real exchange rate around is uh, equilibrium, right, according to this definition of the real exchange rate, they tend to, to increase or to have a higher level of growth, right? Uh, then this is the other relationship uh, for developed countries, and there is no uh, really uh, any relationship, right? This is an example for all the developing countries. It's basically pretty much similar to the first chart, right? The, for the only countries that I, I, I could see a relationship between a, a real exchange rate uh, devaluation and growth, it was for the uh, Asian countries. For the Asian countries, you can see more or less here a positive relationship, right? But for the other countries like Latin America, right, or for African countries, I didn't see any relationship at all. <coughs> Okay, so once I estimate the index of undervaluation, over overvaluation, right? I use this uh, index and I start running this duration, right? This is economic growth in terms of the GDP per capita in the lag, and the index of undervaluation, right? This is for the growth rate and this is for the growth rate of the GDP per capita. And what I found out is that, uh, well, you can see here that the coefficients are positive for all of them, right? And then I use the fixed effects uh, uh, methodology and also the GNN, 
the general metal moments in order to uh, disappear the, 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 the causality effect of the, the reality chain rate, right? And, and the effect of capital. So, well, I encountered the same results as uh, 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 Roderick and also Daniel Rapet. So, my question is well, yes, the reality chain rate enhanced. The reality chain rate evaluation against economic growth, right? But what are the channels? They don't really explain uh, too well which are the channels through which the, re the reality chain evaluation enhances economic growth. Well, uh, well, I started uh, start exploring different channels how that happened, right? So, and and and, and the first thing uh, as, you, as you know probably is the Marshall level condition. If the Marshall Leonard condition is fulfilled, uh, real exchange evaluation can uh, uh, improve the trade balance, and then uh, uh, the demand will, will be higher and uh, also increase the level of output, and so on and so forth, right? So, but even, even if the Marshall Leonard condition uh, uh, fulfills, even so, uh, we can have contractionary effects of the devaluation, right? Uh, let me read this very quickly. Uh, one of these cases is if the valuation leads to a higher domestic prices due to higher costs, mainly imports, which may create a shift in the distribution of income in favor of capital and against labor. If capital owners have a higher propensity to save than workers, then overall average demand may fall in spite of increased exports. The second case is that uh, in some cases, the valuation increases the indebtedness ratio of firms and governments indebted in foreign currency. So even, even if the marginal condition is fulfilled, these, these uh, two cases could deteriorate the, the economic conditions in, in the economy. Right? So uh, the other uh, section of the paper analyzes the, um, how or which are the components of the aggregate demand that are stimulated after our, our direction devaluation, right? For, for this part, I use the the framework of the stock flow system. And as you can see here, we have uh, the, the, the different components of the aggregate demand, right guys? So, so here we have, for example, the difference between investments and savings, right? So, and a positive uh, part in here is an injection, right? An injection of, of demand, right? The other part is the difference between that, uh, a government expenditure and, and taxes. Right? And the same, right? If, if, if government expect is higher than taxes, that will create an expansion of demand. And the other part is uh, export minus imports. Again, the same, right? So, and this equation is equal to zero once we, we have this assumption, right, guys? That investment uh, will uh, consider undesired inventory change. Otherwise, this equation will not be equal to zero. Okay? So, what I did, uh, once I, I calculate the index of, of undervaluation, overvaluation following uh, Roderick, is to correlate these uh, 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 <coughs> years where we have a, a real devaluation of the chain rate with these changes in these uh, injections of demand, right? So, and I create these uh, correlations, or what I also, you can say, Chevron uh, multipliers for different regions in, in the world where I could find data. And, uh, and here, for example, is the difference of investment and savings uh, correlated with the, when we have a real devaluation, right? Uh, the other is the same for, the, for this uh, case, uh, government minus taxes uh, with respect to the devaluation. The exports minus imports uh, also uh, correlated with the real devaluation. And this is the, the change in the wage share, right? Uh, divided by also or correlated with the revolution and economic growth uh, uh, divided by the, the changes in the in the uh, other valuation. And uh, uh, to me, uh, explanation to make it quicker, you can see here. If you focus in here, right? It's like the, the summary of each video. And you can see that the only region that is, uh, or uh, the GDP is expanded by an increase in devaluations, is the Asia, Asia, Asia region, right? We have here the, the countries from, from, from Asia, 
And this, you can see that every time that we have a devaluation that enhance or expand the level of, of the money. Uh, I mean, the difference between investment and savings, that increase. Uh, also, uh, this is via the, the, the pool of, of the, the exports, right? This is a devaluation that the exports tend to increase strongly. And also, uh, economic growth, right? Economic growth is expanded uh, because of this devaluation. For developed countries, this is a, it's a very small sample. Uh, these are the summaries of each, uh, of the sums or averages of each region. Um, they are uh, very small. We cannot say that uh, for developed countries, we have evaluation to really enhance economic growth. Right, for Latin American countries, uh, although the multipliers are uh, positive, they are very uh, low, very low levels of expansion. So really, uh, what is telling this is that only for Asian countries, have the evaluation incentivate economic <laughs> No, this is no for, for all, all the countries. Okay, so this is an example for three countries. Uh, China, Argentina, and Mexico. And we can see here, uh, I mean, that China, for example, in this region, right, uh, uh, is where we have a, a positive uh, real devaluation, and that, increase, uh, that increases the level of demand, right? Uh, uh, especially via the exports and the difference between investment and savings. And also here we have yeah, this is uh, the evaluation is it's growth and the evaluation. For this country, uh, the level of the evaluation follows an economic an expansion of the economic growth. And but but for all the countries, every time that the the the, the, the level of uh, under evaluation increases, the, the wage share is affected. I mean uh, it, it basically they are the workers are paying uh, this uh, for this economic growth, right? And the, the foreign direct investment tend to increase, and then later the, the economic growth forms. But for the other countries uh, like Argentina, uh, we can see this this is the area where we have a positive devaluation, right? Uh, and the, the external sector increases or uh, its position because they are more competitive. Competitive, uh, competitiveness. In, in the um, international level increases, so so we can see here a, a pool of demand, right? But you can see, this is very important to see this chart. We have here, well, in the valuation of economic growth, in this case, this is growth, the, the blue line, and it's affected, right? For the first year, we have a, a very serious contraction that happened in Argentina in 2001, 2002, and uh, uh, yes, and then the, the other valuation continues uh, for a certain period of years. And, and, and you can see here, uh, this the blue line is, let's see. Yeah, the devaluation increases after the devaluation 2001, and the waste share, right, uh, decreases. Here, what I'm seeing the difference between Mexico and, and Argentina, right? That they suffer a, a big devaluation. Mexico they suffered the devaluation in 94, 95. Uh, in Argentina, the waste share recovery much faster because the uh, the intervention of the state. Right? Uh, every time that you have a devaluation, a strong devaluation, your compet competitiveness will increase. But uh, if the government, uh, uh, I mean, if the government decides to contract the government expenditure, the, the, there will be a, a contraction, a severe contraction of the money, and for that reason, the economic growth. In the case of Argentina, uh, at, one year after the devaluation, they uh, increased the government expenditure. So for that reason, the waste share recovered quicker than in Mexico. In Mexico, we had the devaluation, and the, the, the waste share uh, took more years in, uh, uh, to recover. Right. So one of the policy implications for this analysis is that every time there is a devaluation, you could increase your competitiveness, but the government should jump in in order to maintain the, the purchasing power of people. Right? And also, I make an analysis uh, uh, in terms of the investment, right? The investment with respect to GDP. Every time there is a devaluation, there is an increase in, um, in investment with respect to GDP. 
And that that level of investment is this, especially increases much faster in developing countries. Right? Uh, to be more precise, uh, in African countries, right, uh, uh, that's the higher increase, but also in Asia and Latin America. <coughs> and the conclusions are this. Uh, there are different balances, samples of effects, right? Remember I mentioned earlier that I separate out the, the sample of countries, right, in order to measure better the, the balance of effect. And for reason, uh, there are different levels of appreciation of evaluation between countries. Only, we can say that only in East Asia, economies have been affected in a positive way from the real devaluations. And number three, the real exchange rate is a double-edged sword. On the one hand, and on the value currency could improve international competitiveness in the short term, but could decrease the wage share over time. Right? Especially if the government uh, decides to, to decrease the government expenditure. And uh, the, what, uh, this is it was one of my my challenges for my dissertation. Now I'm working to try to understand what is happening with employment, with the level of employment. I am uh, taking the whole level of employment and separate this out between the total level of employment and manufacturing employment in order to see which are the um, the sectors that are, are uh, this chorus or uh, uh, improve after a real change in evaluation. What I have uh, uh, encountered so far is that only the manufacturing workers, right, <coughs> increase, but not the whole level of employment. So I, I need to try to explain why this is happening uh, in, 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 those, in those countries. Okay? So, thank you. Standing in for uh, a former student of mine, uh, Delphina Rossi, uh, who uh, came to the LBJ School for a master's degree some uh, three, three years ago. Her career was interrupted uh, by uh, her having been appointed at age 26 uh, by uh, Cristina Fernandez to <coughs> the director of the National Bank of Argentina, an appointment which lasted only a few months until. Christina lost the election, or her successor lost the election. She returned to finish her degree uh, and had the idea of doing this work. Uh, uh, and uh, it is a, uh, um, uh, it is part of uh, a project which many of you have to see the What is the that's the wrong way. Yeah. It's not working. It's, it's not working. Okay. Yeah, so we're not working. Point to the computer. So I need to stand here work. and do this here? Yeah. Yes. All right. Um, All right. Uh, it is part of the University of Texas Inequality Project for which this is the model. I took out this slide. Uh, I didn't have it in this morning, but after listening to Anwar at lunch, I put it back again. Uh, it's been our motto, since Kepler is referenced, that Kepler undertook to draw a curve through the places of Mars and his greatest service to science was in impressing on men's minds that this was the thing to be done if they wished to improve astronomy. They were not to content themselves with inquiring whether one system of epicycles was better than another, but that they were to sit down to the figures and find out what the curve the truth was. So it's good to have a little methodological consistency in these conferences. Put this back. Um, the, um, the work that we have done is entirely based upon a very simple approach to mining administrative data sets by using the between groups component of tiles T statistic uh, to come up with uh, indices of economic inequality. For that, all you need to have is a consistent group structure a population uh, weight for each group, that is to say a share of the total activity, and the average income of the group relative to the population average. So the, the between groups component is all you need. You can ignore the inequality within groups or the, comp or the uh, summing of the inequality within groups to get the overall within group component. Uh, and we've realized and uh, documented it over many, many years that the between groups component, the evolution of it, and in some circumstances, the, le the actual level of it are very good 
uh, instruments or measures of the uh, movement of the entire uh, distribution. One particular data set that we have used a great deal uh, is the um, uh, industrial statistics compiled by the United Nations Industrial Development Organization, uh, a very large scale and reasonably consistent compilation of uh, payrolls and employment by a consistent set of industrial categories over uh, practically all of the countries of the world, for which about 150 yield a consistent uh, time series of industrial pay inequality. Uh, and that enables one to map out over this period, 63 now through 2011, these maps are just up to 2008, uh, the movement of industrial pay inequality across the world, which is itself quite an interesting thing. Sorry that the, uh, the screen does not quite convey the, the color differentials, but this is a, 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 a six-year interval, 63 to 68 in, uh, in this case. Uh, and uh, the uh, color scheme for uh, light to dark blue are decreases in inequality that for ye yellow to orange to red are increases. The maps give you an idea of the coverage of the data and you can just run through over time and show, for example, how in the neoliberal era beginning in 1980, the picture changes very dramatically. And of course, with the uh, uh, end of the Soviet Union and so forth in that region of the world, inequality in this measure rises very dramatically. So you can see global patterns, you can see regional patterns, you can see patterns and movements of individual countries quite clearly. Uh, and you can also see something interesting, particularly if you're interested in the Piketty thesis that inequality always increases, that one get, when one gets past uh, the turning point at two, the year 2000, which is significant also, I think, in Anwar's data, uh, you can see actually that there is a substantial body of the world in which while these measures of inequality remain at very high levels, they actually do tend to come down a bit in the uh, uh, decade following uh, that uh, transition. So uh, it is a body of data with a great deal of, of, of intrinsic interest and that tends to show that there are common patterns across the global economy which in other work I have associated the major turning points with major changes in the financial regime. The breakdown of Bretton Woods in 1971, the outbreak of the global debt crisis in 1980, the peak of the NASDAQ boom and the uh, uh, transition from low to higher commodity prices, the retreat of neoliberalism after 2000 all appear to be important uh, turning points. Uh, this data is significant for its own purposes uh, but also because we were able to show that it is very closely associated with movements of household income inequality as measured by everybody else. And most economic uh, of the economic literature on inequality is rooted in uh, an array of survey measures of, of household income inequality of various types, gross income, net income, uh, and uh, market income. Uh, and we were, we've been able to show that our measures of industrial pay inequality are very significant drivers of a consistent measure of gross household income inequality. Uh, this is a data set that's derivative from the UNIDO data set, UNIDO data set is called Estimated Household Income Inequality, which is based upon a very simple statistical model that relates the tile statistic that we measure directly with uh, an estimate of the, uh, of the Gini coefficient. It's rooted in the regression uh, relationship between our data and other people's data, uh, about 400 overlapping observations of countries and years. Uh, and uh, you can see that the highlighted coefficient, LN final, which is our measure, uh, has a very, very close relationship. It's more volatile than the Gini coefficient very closely related to it. So a movement of industrial pay inequality, not surprisingly, is tends to be associated with a movement of other kinds of inequality because after all, this is a very, uh, a part of economies that tends to be uh, relatively dynamic uh, and of course household incomes are paid to people who work uh, in the industrial sector. The question that Delfina uh, uh, decided to take up was to see whether any particular variable could be found that might be consistently related 
to our measure of industrial pay inequality, and that might be related to it in a theoretically um, relatively easy to understand or clear cut manner. Uh, and the variable that uh, she chose to investigate was uh, nominal exchange rates with respect to the dollar. Data for which uh, one has a comparable density of measures. Every country has an exchange rate. Uh, and we have uh, maybe 4,000 observations of industrial pay inequality across the 50 year period for 150 countries. So we're able to construct the two time series. There's no reason a priori to expect them to be uh, you know, co-integrated. They're, they're, they're two quite different things from a standpoint of, of, of uh, standard economic theory. They're not closely associated. Uh, well, they, uh, uh, but our view was uh, that they might well be. And the view is really very simple. Uh, that is that in any country, there are two types of industries. Those that sell to the outside world and those that don't. Those are the two possibilities. Right? Nobody sells to Mars. Uh, so you can either sell inside or sell outside predominantly. But if you sell to the outside world, you're in Mexico and you're selling glass or sulfur or brake parts to the United States, and the peso depreciates, then the next morning, your sector has more peso income because it's earning the same number of dollars, it translates into more pesos. If you are, however, selling haircuts or taxi rides or, uh, or uh, inexpensive textiles, apparel in the domestic market, your income in pesos is the same. And since it is a general rule, uh, practically invariable, the country, the industries that sell to the outside world are better paid industries that don't. Exports tend to be from your most productive sectors. And this will then result in an increase in the dispersion of industrial pay. An increase, therefore, in our inequality measure, which is precisely designed to pick up differences across sectors. So, stands to reason that this could be true. The question is, is this an important relationship? It would also stand to reason, by the way, that if it is true, that there is a relatively clear-cut causal link. You would not run the link backwards from a change in inequality to a change in the exchange rate. The, inequality, the exchange rate changes for some financial or trade-related purpose, mostly financial in the modern world, and it translates mechanically. It doesn't require a J-curve or any other behavioral response. It translates mechanically the next morning uh, into a difference in the differential in industrial pay. And we have just shown you from this equation that that translates into a difference uh, in movement of household pay inequality. So it's significant also for the broader spectrum of inequality measures. So then the question is, OK, let's just compile the data uh, and put it together and see what it shows. Oh, OK. So here, um, the bar graphs represent the movements of the exchange rate. The lines represent the inequality movements. Uh, and we, uh, rather she, uh, did a rather lot of work, uh, which is represented here both with time series and uh, uh, scatter plots uh, and, uh, uh, and exchange rates. Uh, and this is the case of uh, we, we put, put, use both developed and developing countries uh, and uh, the little tour of the world. It's not necessarily in the most systematic order, but uh, you can see that the relationship uh, here is quite close. Uh, there's Singapore, there's Canada, it's remarkably close. Canada, this is a dollar exchange rate. You expect a country, the relationship to be better for countries that do most of their trading with the United States than it would be for countries that, uh, let's say, in the heart of Europe and, and trade. <coughs> Another exchange rate would be relevant, but there's a particularly uh, clear cut and pure case. Uh, there's uh, let's see, Mexico. Uh, Mexico, the relationship starts being close at a given moment in time. This is uh, this is 1986, the aftermath of the, of the crisis of 1994 and the aftermath of the crisis. Uh, okay. Those gaps there are significant. There's not no data. There's a gap in the data, but uh, you can see the you can see the uh, the scatter plot is what it is. It doesn't uh, uh, it doesn't appear to be affected by that. Uh, and there's Hungary, which is not necessarily a uh, major trading partner in the United States, but still the relationship appears to be. Uh, you, the thing to look for here is 
uh, the slope of the uh, of the uh, of the scatter plot, and if it's upward sloping, that relationship exists, and the steeper it is, the stronger it is. Uh, find case where the slope is uh, not upward sloping. In India, the relationship begins to take shape in guess what year, 1992, uh, when the Indian economy underwent. <coughs> And then after that, I simply went into the appendix of the Alfina's paper, just giving us scattered plots for various countries, Cameroon, Senegal, Indonesia, Bangladesh, China, scattered uh, years, uh, Iran, uh, Egypt, the Czech Republic, Ireland, the Netherlands, Turkey, Argentina, Brazil, Peru, Uruguay. Uh, oh, and then there's uh, one negative relationship. Well, actually, Finland is two, but I just chose Italy because, to paraphrase uh, Richard Nixon, uh, I think it's a shit about the lira. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> at any event, uh, I would argue uh, that this is fairly persuasive evidence that the movement of industrial pay inequality and therefore the movement of uh, household income inequality in a wide spectrum of countries. Maybe not, of course, the United States itself, because it's uh, the basic case, maybe not Germany or a few other of the largest countries, but in a wide spectrum of the world, is highly dependent upon a phenomenon that is largely determined uh, in the international financial markets, and is therefore a monetary and a macro phenomenon, and that this is part and parcel of the case that I and others have been making for a long time, which is that the treatment of inequality should not be done in labor markets, should not be done uh, according to the neoclassical view where you're looking at the characteristic of workers, but is substantially driven by the same monetary macro phenomenon that we use, that we emphasize in, in, in dealing uh, with the larger movements of the labor economy. Uh, how significant are these uh, movements? Just to give you an estimate based upon a two-way fixed effects regression analysis, uh, if uh, we have a coefficient of uh, 0.3 for the elasticity of the tile with respect to the exchange rate, that's like industrial wage inequality. Uh, the Gini is much less uh, flexible than the tile, about one tenth, so a coefficient of about 0.03 uh, for the Gini coefficient for household income inequality. And so a increase uh, of the exchange rate of 50%, valuation of 50%, would be expected to yield a 15% increase increase in the, in the industrial pay inequality measure at 1.5% for the Gini coefficient uh, for incomes. If the Gini is in initially in the range of about 45, which is typical for a lot of uh, uh, developing countries, uh, for developed countries as well, that would be a 50% devaluation gives you a two-thirds of a point. Gini coefficient, lots of devaluations are worse than that. Uh, so that you can see a significant impact on household income inequality is bleeding through uh, from these estimates. The significance of this in practical terms immediately uh, is that it enable ones to want, enables one to make a prediction about what's going to happen to income inequality throughout the developing world now. Uh, because if you go look in the last year or two, you've had massive exchange rate depreciations across much of the developing world, Argentina, Mexico, uh, through Africa. And the uh, implication of that would be that the gains that I just showed you in the reduction of inequality that occurred in the period between 2000 uh, and our most recent data, which is now about 2011, are being or going to be erased very comprehensively. And we're going to see a massive a loss of the, uh, of the social gains uh, that, were, uh, 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 that were made uh, in the post-neoliberal interval now say, rather than period, that began around 2000. And of course, you can see that already happening. It's clear in the political developments. If you look at Argentina, if you look at Brazil, uh, if you look at Venezuela, if you look across, uh, across the world, uh, you're seeing Cuban and Greece, uh, and you're seeing uh, a corresponding political uh, return of, um, of oligarchical interests that are deeply committed to the neoliberal project and to uh, inter free international capital movements with the result of uh, severe uh, loss standing for lower income populations.
So my presentation will be about the energy to ratio. What do you make a big deal or not? Do you make a big deal or not about it? Actually, with Dr. Galbraith, it was very interesting because he actually wrote a paper, policy note for Levy in 2011, talking about uh, is the federal debt unsustainable regarding real interest rates and uh, growth rate, and which we should actually look at at the very end of the slides. So basically, let's start. And um, as you said, you know, lots of things spilled about it. Very, deep, very little data is actually looked at. The classic data everyone looked at was Ronald and Rogoff in 2011, the big you know fiasco with their data, which. Was it a fiasco after all in a slight way? But the most important thing was they look at defaults and the growth rate. The problem with defaults is you don't have that many defaults, so you have to go back to a huge time set. And in the Rogoff case, they went back eight centuries, 800 years. The structural characteristics are massively different, even in like eight years or 80 years. And like to look at eight centuries is a huge thing. So you want to look at something much more focused if we can. So. We will instead try to look at how the GDP ratio itself, the GDP ratio itself, affects the real interest rates, and we'll compare two sets of countries, the OECD and the developing world. So you have a natural experiment, if you will. Instead of just looking at the regression itself, compare them to, to each other and see if there actually is a difference or not. Um, it's panel data, slightly unbalanced. That's an underestimate, but it's the reality we live with. Uh, all indicators on the WDI, because we don't have any money, so we take <laughs> whatever we can with free. Uh, 20, 20, 20 years, 2019 to 2012, uh, 20 OCD countries and 40 developing countries. Um, BRICS are all in the 40 developing countries, and in fact, you would actually see, and I'll just mention this right now, even if you remove the United States and Japan from the OECD, the data does not change, everything remains the same. If you remove the BRICS from the developing countries, nothing changes. So it actually is quite semi-robust, I would argue, in this case. The model in the end comes up to, we model the real interest rate as a function of the GDP ratio of the central government, GDP per capita, inflation rate, percentage of population of working age, and the remittances received. Remittances are important, at least in the early stage of the simulation of the model, to consider because developing countries have almost 5% of the GDP coming from remittances. Developed countries obviously would have half a percent at most, but it ended up being not as much significant as you will see in the next slide. So uh, these are the data we have. It's a dynamic panel to correct for a correlation, and everything, the top one is developing countries, the bottom is OECD countries. Here's the critical question. If your debt to GDP ratio goes up by 10%, your real interest rate will go up by 1.2%. For a developed country or OECD country, if it goes up by 10%, it will actually go down in real terms at 1%. So the MMT theory holds, at least in developed countries, in that central government debt has almost no effect on real interest rates. So you should not worry about it. You have to worry about it in developing countries, but think about it. If your entire debt to GDP ratio went to 100%, your real interest rate is at 12% real at, at that point. You know? So the question is, is there a policy space we can talk about for developing countries? And think about it. So in the next slide I want to talk about is, just for, for the econometrists in the room, if we just ignore the dynamic panel and go to fixed effects, does the results change? And as you'll see, they actually don't. I mean. The coefficient the same, the standard errors are the same almost, so the whole thing is not that bad. Uh, going back again to the dynamic panel, just to notice a few things. Uh, if I can have the laser pointer work. Okay. Okay. Oh, it did work. The laser pointer is working. If you notice, um, so inflation as it increases, uh, this is quite significant. As inflation increases in a developing country, the, re the real interest rate actually drops. But it does not mean you take a lower yield as inflation is increasing. It only means that you do not predict what the inflation would be when you actually made the investment policy. So you hope for 10% inflation, you made an investment for like you know 11% return, inflation ended up being 12%. So do not make the assumption that you know, negative rate means that they're taking a lower yield. In the, in the developed countries, obviously, they're asking for a higher yield because their range is much more smaller. So their predictability is much more stable. All the signs, otherwise the signs are pretty stable all over the place, and obviously no, the critical sign is this positive, and this is negative. Um, so, <clears throat> now what do we do? We're like looking at developing countries right now. If you have a policy question to ask, what can I do with the policy space? So in 2010, the mean balance for all these things were, that was usually 45%, the GDP per, per capita 7K, inflation 5%, working population 6%. Here's the problem with the working population. It just says how much of the population is between the ages of 50 to 65. It does not say how much 
is employed, which is a very big controversial thing because most countries, developing countries, contaminate that number. So the WDI, the World Bank does not actually measure that. We have to find other proxies. The second problem is, which you didn't do in this model, is a uh, developed country, the 44, the 33 percent is not working you know, at that age, could be older. Whereas for a developing country, they're much younger. So we have to adjust for that simulation much later on. But at this point, we stick with this. 4%, as I said, is approximately the remittances. Per, this is all in percentage of GDP. So 5% of GDP is your remittances. So if you look at that, we do the measurement values. You know, you plug in our coefficients all, all over here and how much we see. In the end, we see the real interest rate is plus 3.3%. The growth rate for the same sample of countries for 2010 is 5.6, which means we have, as long as the real interest rate on debt is smaller than the growth rate, Thus, we have stable debt dynamics. So, which means we have 2.3, in this story, at least in 2010, we have 2.3% policy headroom. Or, in other words, if you divide by that, the debt can increase approximately, let's say, 20%, which means this developed, the, the mean developing country can take 20% more debt for to have a, let's say, 20, you know, 63% total debt to GDP ratio. But remember, again, this number, the real interest rate that we get, is actually lending interest rate minus inflation. This is not actually the rate paid by the central government to bonds because that data is actually, again, expensive to get and you don't have it. So we can easily expect that this number here will be actually like, you know, lower by, let's say, 2%, you know? So re on average, we should expect maybe another 2% of discount for government bonds. So we could easily increase this GDP number to approximately 80%. But that's the whole thing. In a developed country, because of the correlate, because of the correlation, there's no causation, obviously, we can't prove that, right? But we say that because debt to GDP ratio is affecting the real interest rate, we have this headroom of approximately 70% to 80% debt we can take. However, because of developing countries, we know it's negative, we don't have to worry about it. So we can go 100%, 200%, 300%. The whole question is, we will not pay off the debt. That's not the entire point. The entire point is, we will not be an exponential growth of the debt, as long as R is less than G. If we go above that, that's when the instability happens, which Dr. Galbraith in his paper in 2011 actually talked about. But as long as you go below that, and if the country is increasing, in fact, if we have stability, it actually might decrease as a ratio because GDP is growing faster than the debt, and of course, inflation helps in those cases. So overall, that's the entire conclusion that we're trying to say that if you work up on policy space for developing countries, the number to look for is a 10% increase in your debt only increases your real interest rate at 1.2%, not true for developed OECD countries, and this is what you can extract from it. So with that, thank you for it. Thanks. some of them go free floating again. So the, the entire point of the panel argument was to do the panel in such a way that you capture all the different heterogeneous aspects of different countries together, which is why I did not do the fixed effects model, because then it removes the heterogeneities from the model for us to worry about. So I would say yes, that's, that would require a bit more detailed research, but for our overall rule of thumb, let's say, right, you know, we can, you know, I, I think uh, I tried to like remove certain countries that remove like, you know, Latin America, I tried to see the run numbers, and remove Africa, and then see the numbers. And they don't change. I mean, the, the significance of it doesn't change. The interest rate changes to be by a factor of like you know five percent. So it's like so it's like one point one two becomes like point one one or something, or point one zero. So it's not really a big deal. So we just so if you somehow have to define a period of real fiat currency uh, situation. You don't think things will change? No, I don't think. At least the data would not show it. At least the data for the one I have does not show. It. That's the most safer statement. Yeah, um, the most influential survey of these matters in the last few years has been by Reinhardt and Rodolf. Yes. Um, you mentioned them. 
but you don't tell us what you think about their work, um, and um, what the flaws in it, if any, were. But it's certainly, in policy terms, the most... Oh, very, very, very powerful. Very important. Yeah. What's your view? Uh, well, I mean, uh, since the UMass thing, I mean, the UMass, the UMass had actually showed that the data was slightly flawed. I mean, I think everybody, I think the PK audience was new, so I sort of assumed, you know, I would not talk about it. But uh, my opinion on that is that, well, Grobach is extremely influential. I mean, maybe, like, the third most influential economist right now after, like, you know, this is is more influential, but I think Grobach has more power, let's say, in that sense. Uh, they, are, they, they talk more about defaults, and especially for the fact, especially I think Sargent had a very influential paper, which he quoted or at least uh, co not quoted, but co advised uh, Rogoff was how the United States tries to devalue its debt through inflation. And I think that's a new angle they're doing instead of direct sovereign default, like you know, defaulting on debt by burning, you know, like just inflating it away. And how from 1949 to 1972, let's say, you know, we actually had negative real interest negative yields on a central debt. So I think Rogoff is going to go in a different direction now and go in a different way, like after the, you know, under the road, that big thing. Because they're talking less about explicit defaults and more about defaults to inflation regime. So I think we will see more of those kind of papers coming in you know, as the investment industries turn. I, I can offer you my view. <laughs> <laughs> um, the book, which I read and reviewed, was a largely innocuous compilation of historical data whose accuracy could not really be checked by anybody because nobody else would have the same degree of energy. But it also didn't uh, come to any conclusions. The 90% threshold was inserted, in, as far as I know, in an NPR paper published after the book. Its foundation, the book was very unclear, but the two were, the one lent propaganda weight to the other. The 90% threshold paper, which Tom Herndon uh, tried to reproduce, Tom uh, is not only a UMass graduate student, but he's a native of Austin, Texas, which is yeah. a significant detail, <laughs> uh, found that, uh, that not only uh, that it was uh, there were mistakes of formatting and, and putting things in, copy and paste mistakes on the spreadsheet. But there were many different sources of error and that there was essentially no foundation for the notion of a 90% threshold. No foundation for it. And there's other papers, I think, that uh, pointed out that the evidence for this rested, among other things, on other uh, specifically on the case of New Zealand, a very important country, mind you, and it's a beautiful country. It has all of two million people. Uh, in 1951, a rather remote year before I was born, uh, during which there was uh, a uh, massive port strike as the New Zealand labor unions attempted to capitalize on the demand for wool from the US military at the outset of the Korean War. Uh, now, this data point shows up very prominently in the general realization uh, proposition that, that a very high debt level leads you into financial trouble. Uh, it does not meet even the remotest standard of scholarly care. Not the remotest one. So their object was a propagandist one? Their well, let's just say that they were taken, whatever, the, I don't like to read people's motives, but they did not repudiate, so far as I could tell, or distance themselves from the massive propaganda use of this document by officials all across uh, uh, the, uh, the financial sector of the main But I mean, just last question. Their conclusion was based on priors of some kind, and the most important one was the, the belief, uh, presumably, that um, uh, 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 the increase in debt is just a bad thing, and uh, public debt, and that uh, a government should uh, keep it as low as possible. Is that the sort of prior? I have no idea. I mean, I, my view is when you put this kind of work out before the public, uh, your motives should not be assumed to be of one kind or another. That you should not be given the benefit of the doubt of having conducted an honest inquiry. I'm not accusing them of doing something else, but I, when the work is as bad as that, I don't believe it should. We should then treat the authors of the work with the 
uh, with the deference that you give to people who make a more serious effort to get the numbers right. That's my view. Um, I want to follow up on that issue. There are two questions. One is the replication and deconstruction of their methodology, assuming their theory and their data. And but then the other question, which I thought you began with, was what's the relationship between debt to GDP and the interest rate? And then I wonder why uh, you are adopting their methodology and their. This theory. is not their methodology, though. They don't actually. Fo they follow actually how many debt to GDP ratio leads to default. I'm sorry. How does debt to GDP ratio leads to default? So they say about 90 percent, they are more likely to default. I, I'm sorry, I didn't say that right. The theory. Uh -huh. So why are these variables the variables that you pick? Oh, okay, okay. So you have uh, a pretty standard variables. So yeah, yeah. So you are basically following the standard neoclassical yes, yes, story, yes, and matter. then somehow saying that's an explanation. From my point of view, already uh -huh. you are off the track. I see. And uh, to 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 build policy implications uh -huh. from that, you should be asked, well, you then thrown your lot in, so to speak, yes. with them yeah. on the on the theory side, and you're arguing about whether or not the data can give you a somewhat better point of view. I can see this an internal critique, yeah. but it has a difficulty for me that's pretty Well, serious. here's the dilemma. So given the fact that the conversation now is about the GDP ratio, the question is at least can we move it towards a direction which is more amenable to what we can help with, with, right? So for example, the classic example is, we show developing countries, there's no correlation. If there's a negative correlation between the GDP ratio and the, and the real interest rate. So we can talk, when people talk about like, you know, unsustainable debt, we can say, well, it's not. Here's the data, right? No one actually shows this data. People talk about it, but you know, we, can at least, we can at least show using your neoclassical methods and your data and the World Bank you know, unbiased data, we can show that nothing is, there's nothing significant here for OECD countries. So you should not worry about that as, a, as an issue. Well, well, but the, the, the second, no, that's, that's a jump. That's a jump that bothers me. Uh -huh. You are showing that their structure doesn't produce a result when you look at it somewhat differently. Uh -huh. It doesn't follow, of course, uh -huh. that debt to GDP has no mm -hmm. impact because you are not using anything but their structure. You're still entirely within their, their world view. Yes, I have so the world view, so just, just to talk about the interest rate, uh, because that's the conversation they want to have. But if I were to want to know whether debt to GDP does in fact ah, have exactly. an impact, I wouldn't pick yeah, that. Yes, exactly. That's a, deeper, that's a deeper question. Yeah, yeah well, but that's, so that's, that's another question, unfortunately, we can't yeah, engage okay. in, obviously. Well, let me ask a question of uh, Jamie, which is different. I got lost somewhere in there about the causal relationship. Your paper was absolutely fascinating. I haven't absorbed it at all. It's too quick. But uh, what is the connection between exchange rate devaluation and industrial pay inequality? I heard you say it, but it, I, I... Very think. simple. It's a mechanical and accounting relationship. Any country has two types of industry. Those that sell to the outside and those that don't. That's a complete comprehensive classification. Yeah. Right? When, if you're a developing country in particular, but almost any country, if you depreciate, then the local currency value of your exports goes up the next morning. Right? By the amount of the depreciation. The dollars that you, or whatever euro that you earn are worth more in local currency terms. If you're selling tortillas on the street in Mexico, you have the same number of pesos. So there's no difference. Now, it's, since it's normally the case that the exporters are better paid than the import computers, as a rule, that's going to increase an inequality measure. It's a straight force. Okay. Yeah. Now, where the money is going inside the high paid sector, I don't see. It may all be going to uh, preserve the real incomes of the, ch of the executives and the engineers, the line workers may be getting them. Or nothing. But that too would act to accelerate the increase of inequality because obviously the engineers and the executives are paid more than the line workers. So what's going on inside the sector isn't going to contradict the movement that you observe between sectors. And so when you see that, then you've got a driving force. Since clearly this is the causality is coming from the outside, it has to run from the forces driving the exchange rate, which are global financial forces generally, to the forces driving industrial pay. And from industrial pay, because we've already established that relationship, to the much more stable and inertial pattern of, in, of household income inequality, which also shows up in the data. So I would argue this is, a, this is as clear a causal 
link chain as one could reasonably expect to find. It's not there's there's no there's no reverse arrow of arrow of causality that's in the story that's possible. I have a question regarding yeah. that because if you depreciate your cost of imports, especially energy, goes up. And the burden will be hit more by the poor than the rich, depending upon how you want Maybe to see it. Maybe a secondary effect. So, the, so, so have you, do you have actually imports issues in your con as control factors? Because no, the, because that's not going to affect the industrial pay at the okay. moment. But the inequality overall that you want to It reflect. could conceivably have an effect on real income differentials that could further uh, this, but that would be very hard to establish in any independent data. And the reason for that is that, that what you need would then, would then, then would be really good data on, independent data on household income inequality. And the fact is, and I can show you with rafts of other papers, that in the international comparative data sets, of which, by the way, I regret to say that WDI is by far and away the worst, uh, the, uh, you simply can't get, you, you can't do it. It's not, it, 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 you don't have that kind of high quality you uh, say when there is a devaluation in, in developing countries, uh, that trigger uh, inflation, right? That trigger inflation, and if the country usually import a lot of raw materials or imports, right, there will be an increase in, in prices, right? And the and usually the wages uh, <coughs> don't don't uh, keep up with an increase in, in prices, so that that increases the, the gap, right? That increases the gap. And the inequality also rises. Well, but you're, but you're making a jump at the end of that sentence. Everything you say is right up until this question of inequality. Uh, I cannot make that leap without knowing what the structure is uh, and how it's affected by this movement of external uh, the movement of the terms of trade. So, I, 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 it, yes, you're right. It will depress living standards if food prices and energy prices go up. Assuming we're talking about an importer rather than an exporter, uh, but uh, the uh, 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 I just would remain careful about making a declarative statement about inequalities. Uh, well, this, the one I this is what I could uh, I, I show. I mean, every time that is at the end evaluation. The, the, weight, the, the weight share declines. But that's we, functional. That's yeah. a functional distribution, whereas, whereas what, what we're talking about here is the, is the, is, is the yeah. household distribution. Yeah, but usually also, I mean, they, they, they are correlated. Of course right. they are. They are correlated. Yeah. So, so. Reasonable inference, I'm just saying I don't have it on that end. Yeah. 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 a question for Francisco. Um, when I was looking at your results, I was, uh, I was wondering what other factors might be going on, partly because there was such a scatter around the lines, but also because, for example, you saw the strongest result for Asia, but your period was going from 1990 to 2011, so that's right after the Asian financial crisis on one end, and another financial crisis where they were less effective than other people. So it's that, you know, I'm wondering what is... So yeah. maybe I misunderstood how you did your... Yeah, well, the sample, the sample is from the 60s to 2010. So uh, I, I did different, uh, my, my, my methodology is different to Rodrick. I mean, I'm taking the same equation that he uses, mm -hmm. but, but uh, I also, I'm adding uh, another variable, the, because if you only use the, the period uh, the dummy, and also I included the, the, the cross section, right, this is the first part. And also, in addition to that, I split the sample between different developing and developed, mm -hmm. and also from Africa, from, from Asia, mm -hmm. and from Latin America, mm -hmm. and developed countries as well. So, but also I split the sample from the 60s to the 80s, from the 80s to the 2010. So the patterns remain. I mean, they are basically the same in, in, in all these periods. Nice. But also, also taking this, the, the, whole, the whole sample, basically it's the same. Okay. But in all of, all of them, the Asian countries follow that positive pattern with the pre devaluation. So it's more strong with the impact in them. Okay. In, in Latin American countries, uh, I didn't encounter a strong impact. Although there is one. Uh, the, the external sector uh, usually could be useful. Thank you. Jamie, uh, you're, what, one of the things I'm worried about is when the exchange rate changes, does Industries that post only used to sell domestically suddenly be able to sell foreign as well. In other words, doesn't the uh, what is a export industry and what is a just wholly domestic industry 
can be affected by the change in the exchange rate. Is, that, is this important empirically, or is it only not, theoretical? Not, not in the very short run, no, it's not important. It does, doesn't, no, when you look no, at it, no, no, I mean, no. you've looked at all these countries for over uh, I, 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 We're measuring here things that are happening on a year-to-year -year basis, uh, that kind of structural change. Uh, first of all, it's unlikely to occur, I mean, exchange rate of a country uh, is not going to transform the competitiveness yes. of, let's say, a second-tier automobile sector or so forth. I mean. That's the question. That's not going to, no, no, it's not going to happen. If you're, particularly if you're talking about the universe of countries uh, that are selling their exports to countries richer than themselves, they have to basically sell their highest quality products. Now you're moving down to a lower quality product when you move into the products that are only produced so far for the domestic market. So and then that's not going to be, that's not going to be driven too much by, uh, by the movement. Well, let me put it in a slightly different. To what to the extent does the change in the exchange rate lead a American producer to outsource or actually build a factory in another country and therefore create an export industry? Is it, are we talking? Uh, well, we I, I, I think what ha actually happened in the United States was a massive appreciation of the exchange rate in 1981. I was there at the Joint Economic Committee when it happened. It was up by 60%. The effects were a catastrophic uh, reduction of the uh, uh, competitiveness and capacity of the industrial sector. This is the creation of the Rust Belt. Uh, and um, the result after that uh, was, of course, a uh, the, you know, the flow of, of imports uh, of comparable products into the United States greatly increased. So yes, the exchange rate can and has mattered uh, to uh, both to, to the structure of U.S. industry and to the U.S. income distribution. And I documented that statistically in my book in 1998, it created an equal. Um, the, uh, it's, it's more important as an effect than these flow effects are per se. Economists seem to have been rather preoccupied or uh, uh, taken with the idea that you could measure effects on prices by physical changes in physical flows. So they use the export-import uh, uh, ratios and so forth. But actually the exchange rate, which is a price, is going to have a much more direct effect on relative prices. In terms of that strikes me as a, as a reasonable position, one which is clearly borne out in the data. Um, in terms of uh, once that pattern is established, the movement to outsource, I'm a little skeptical. I think that uh, you have such a large absolute differential in costs, whether you're moving to Mexico or moving to China or someplace else, that a movement of the um, RMB exchange rate is likely to be a very small consideration. I mean, you can reduce your wage costs by 80%, uh, and 10% movement of the, of the Chinese uh, currency isn't going to make a strong difference to that. And I think what's, kind of, what's happened, obviously, when you read about the papers, <coughs> that, the, that the principal sourcers of American products, Boeing, for example, instructs its suppliers that they will have a better chance of retaining their contracts if they do their assembly across the border in Tijuana. And so they do. Right? But that doesn't have anything to do with the value. The Boeing is not capital in value and pay. So it knows that the Mexican worker is not going to be more expensive than the Los Angeles worker. Make its prediction, its cost calculations based on that. Well, one final prediction. There is more than one exchange rate for some industries. Uh, sure. What I think of, for example, is China having a great export surplus to the United States in the 90s and so on. And then now having the problem that Vietnam's exchange rate with the dollar is worse, than, than worse in some sense, than the Chinese exchange rate they suddenly lose their sales to export to the Vietnamese similar industry. So, I mean, when you look at, you're only looking at one exchange rate, isn't it possible that uh, when exchange rates change? Well, the two issues here, one is, one is that yes, uh, of course, you can have displacement from China to Vietnam. That's not an exchange rate question. That's well, a question of relative it, labor costs, right? Well, it, it could be, uh, 
change the difference in the exchange rate. It could, be, it could be affected by it, but it's, but it's primarily the fact that the Vietnamese worker costs less. Uh, and so, uh, but the other thing um, I would point to there with respect to our work is that we did all of this with the dollar exchange rate. And so uh, countries where the effect may well be very prominent, that it may be, if they are not primarily traders with the dollar, but with the Eurozone, with the British, with sterling, or uh, with the Japanese yen, uh, then maybe the other exchange rate would show up more strongly. Uh, but that's an extra layer of work, and unfortunately, I have I have the misfortune that my students tend to graduate and go on to do other things. In spite of my best efforts to stall this process, I, I tend to lose them. I'm, I'm, I'm required to go with what they need. Uh, Professor Gavin, I mean, instead of using the dollar exchange, you would just, I mean, you are one of your future graduate students would just use the nominal effective exchange rate to see if this pattern holds. For, for. Yeah, you, and there lot, there, there, obviously, there's a lot of additional statistical work that we could do, but this this particular result strikes me as so uniformly interesting across such a spectrum of countries that uh, calling your attention to it seems to be worthwhile at this stage. One last question. I, I just want to make that a comment. I that maybe if you incorporate uh, the, the current account. Maybe also that, I mean, I, I did that before for the Latin American countries, and uh, it was strongly significant. Yeah. We actually tried it, it actually didn't pop, didn't pop out. That's the problem. Yeah. Yeah, we tried it in the panel, but it actually did not have that much of an effect. In fact, if you look at it, except for like the first uh, debt and uh, inflation, everything else is actually quite weak. I mean, so that was all the weirdest thing. In fact, I think demographics is more important at this stage. We think the age distribution of the population actually is much more powerful. So we have actually the next level, I think, we really could explore that aspect. So you you really try it? We we try it. Yeah, we discuss it. Yeah. Maybe, maybe just leave the sample. The sample. Yeah, we'll do it. Sounds fine. First one. Go ahead. Jamie, if if your nar narrative is correct that <coughs> countries with larger exports, probably is it correct to then assume that countries with larger exports we have more of this effect that you just talked about, and if so, would it show up in your? Not, uh, that's an interesting question and not one that I've um, thought through carefully. Uh, it strikes me that uh, it's not necessarily the case, as I can see a small export sector, which is particularly high wage, having, uh, you know, which therefore controls or earns a fairly large share of the national income, despite it being a small technology sector. Uh, having this effect uh, uh, showing up in the in, in, in an inequality statistic, uh, which uh, would, uh, I don't know that that effect would necessarily be larger or smaller than if half of the industries of the country are major exporters. Maybe. I haven't thought about it systematically. I don't think it's necessarily the case. One of, I mean, one of the things you see in the U.S. data is that the movement of uh, Pay and especially and even income inequality uh, measured, for example, across counties is intensely concentrated in five counties in the late 1990s. It's uh, in New York, New York, three counties in Northern California, guess which? Santa Clara, San Mateo, and San Francisco, and one county in Washington State, King County, Seattle. Right? Take like, those five out of the data, and half of the intercounty increase goes away. Take 15 counties out of the data, out of 3,150, it all goes away. So you're looking at income inequality measures which are being driven by the movements of stratospheric incomes concentrated on some very small numbers of people. That's what inequality is. It's about having small numbers of people with very, very much higher incomes. So let's thank our speakers.